It's the drive. Fueled by BriggsAuto.com. Briggs has over 100 miles of cars, so shop today at BriggsAuto.com. Now, let's start the drive. Good evening, Wildcat and Jayhawk fans, and welcome to the drive sponsored by Briggs Auto Group. I am Tim Fitzgerald at GoPowerCat.com, and the man beside me is Michael Swain of Fog.net. Michael, this is it. Last team's lost. This will be the last show of the year. It feels like the last day of school. Sad to see it end, but happy for the memories we made along the way. You can make new friends besides me. That's important to him. Hey, you can interact with us on social media at Facebook.com slash The Drive Show, on Twitter at The Drive 13, and of course, answer our weekly poll question. And make your game predictions on our Twitter page. And remember, if you ever miss an episode of The Drive, you can listen to an audio-only version that will appear each Monday morning in the form of a podcast at both GoPowerCat.com and Fog.net. And if you miss us, just go back and listen to old episodes. That'll be weird, but you can do that. Let's get things started with our two-minute drill. The first segment of the two-minute drill sponsored by Vanderbilt's Your Work Boot Center. All right, Fitz, we'll start with K-State. And the Wildcats came within one game of the Final Four again, but lost to FAU 79-76 to in the East Regional Finals. Let's stick with the game right now. What went wrong for the Wildcats? They got outplayed. Uh, you know what? Uh, it's easy to blame, um, uh, like some coaches do, luck. Uh, what else? Uh, their little insignificant players were better. Jerome Tang uh, handled it with grace and because he knew his team just got outplayed. FAU consistently made plays through this game that were difference makers. The biggest stat of the night wasn't their remarkable, what, 21 turnovers that K-State did cash in for 30 points. It was the fact that Florida Atlantic out-rebounded K-State. Yeah, you might want to sit down for this. 44 to 22. Now, that's a stat I hadn't seen from this K-State team all season, but we also knew this all season long, that going up against big men was going to be a trouble for K-State. Could they wear down Vlad Golden? Could they attack him, get him into foul trouble? The answer was no. The big guy for FAU, who uh, really hasn't been that awesome the whole tournament, was awesome against Kansas State. They couldn't handle him in any way. That's why K-State feared being in Purdue's bracket because they had a great big man. Well, it wasn't him that did him in. It was Golden. And even at the very end, when Kansas State needed to play, it just didn't look as sharp as they have in the past. It didn't. The Wildcats just simply didn't know what they were trying to accomplish there as the game was wearing down. Marquise Noel passed up a shot. The, the one time of the game where he kind of passed it on himself, tried to get it to Ish Masood, and Ish was maybe a little surprised by the pass and fumbled the ball. At the end of the day, FAU was indeed the better team. And you can complain about the foul calls against Keontae Johnson, but as I've said at GoPowerCat.com, I guess it'll be up on Monday, you can't control what the referees do. You can't control what the other team does in terms of lucky shots. What you can control is not getting beat on the boards. What you can control is when a ball's loose on the floor, you don't lose it three out of four times because that's exactly what happened to K-State in this game. FAU wanted it more, Michael, and they got it. They're going to the Final Four. An unbelievable run, but there are three newcomers to the Final Four. It's incredible. It is, and FAU deserves a lot of credit, yeah. right? This is a run that they've had to beat really good teams, and they've been the better team, I think, down the stretches in a lot of those games. So I think they credit, but for K-State, too, right? A great season under Jerome Tang for his first year. Man, FAU's won 30 games uh, plus this year. They are legit We'll get to more about Jerome Tang's program in a little bit. Well, there was plenty of off-season movement in Lawrence with four players entering the transfer portal this past week. Michael, what do you make of the move so far? Yeah, I mean, in times like this, I think about a saying that Bill's health has. It's faces change, expectations don't. And I think when you look at this past season, what was the part of the team that didn't live up to expectations? Well, it was the bench, right? KU had the least amount of bench minutes in the Big 12, um, some of the worst in all of college basketball. And those are the types of players that you're seeing transfer right now. You know, we can start with the guard position with someone like Joseph Yesifu, who came to KU from Drake uh, in the 2021 off season. He didn't live up to expectations as a three-point shooter, a guy that can be a microwave player off the bench. What happened a lot of times is that he'd get lost offensively. And then on the other end, defensively, he couldn't make up for being an undersized guard in the Big 12. You look at someone like Bobby Pettiford, who 
When he got to Kansas, Bill Self spoke very highly of him. Said he was the next great guard that was going to come through Kansas. Well, injuries really limited what he could do. And in the end, he has to transfer to try and find playing time because he has the same amount of eligibility as Dewan Harris. And nobody's going to get more minutes than Dewan Harris while he is at Kansas. And then you look at the front court, right? Zach Clements, another guy that injuries really hampered throughout his time. And Lawrence doesn't necessarily fit what Bill Self wants to do. More of a three-point shooting big man. Isn't so much uh, tough in the interior like Bill Self wants. And then there's Cam Martin, who played a grand total of 10 minutes over two years. Some of that redshirted last year. Had a separated shoulder early in the season. Really never came back from that. And again, a different type of big man that Bill Self has had. So I think collectively, these are kind of the four you see right now. I think there might be more that come this next week. I think it's just a part of what you've seen after disappointing ends to seasons, right? After 2019, okay, you kind of revamped the roster. After 2021, okay, you revamped the roster, won the title next year. I think you're gonna see a very similar type of revamping of the roster this off season that you saw during those two off seasons. So overall, it's not something that's overly concerning. If these were big starting players, and maybe would be concerning. But for me, I think it's just a part of college basketball in modern day where there's going to be roster turnover and you're going to have to get used to new faces every year. It's crazy. What the transfer portal's done to this game is both awesome and awful, but it is the reality and you have to deal with it. And this is going to actually, in a weird way, now be an advantage. When you can run off the players that aren't being productive for you and bring in new players, uh, I don't know how that's a bad thing for a program. It's maybe not great for the kids. Yeah, and here's the thing too, right? You think about all these NCAA tournament teams. It wouldn't shock me if Joseph Yesvu, Bobby Pettiford are on an NCAA tournament yep. team as a role player down the road. Just didn't work for them that's at great. Kansas. Well, we talked about coaches a minute ago, and last week Tom Izzo said that the Big Ten was the best conference in America before Jerome Tang responded and said the Big 12 was the best. Fits. Does the Big 12, 10 even come close to what the Big 12 was this season? Not this past season. No, they didn't. They didn't even come within. Uh, it just it wasn't even comparable. Look, if we go back to the regular season, Big 12 was clearly the best conference from top to bottom. Now, nobody's ever argued that all the most dominant teams were in the Big 12. That's not at all what's being said here. What's being said here is the fact that the Big 12 was so competitive, they beat the snot out of each other every week. But it's clear now that they have the Final Four set and there's no Big 12 teams, that there's plenty of good teams around the country, Michael. And that includes teams from the Big East, which, headline, might have been the best conference in the nation this year. But also because of what we've seen with the transfer portal and the COVID bonus year, we are seeing teams that have emerged now, including San Diego State, that are benefiting from this. <clears throat> San Diego State's average age on a college basketball team this season, they were the most veteran team in the tournament, and they're going to the Final Four, the average 23 years old as a college team. Now, this will eventually go away as the COVID years kind of fall off the end of it, uh, you know, players that weren't here for the COVID season, but we're just gonna have it for a year, maybe two more. Um, and it's been impactful. It has, and it's been great. You think about really good college basketball, experience wins in March, and you're seeing a lot of these experienced teams win in March, right? Even someone like UConn isn't necessarily relying on a bunch of freshmen, right? Alex Caravan is a true freshman, but he's not someone that is the star player of that team. They've got veterans, and San Diego State's another one. I think Creighton obviously played in the Elite Eight. They're a veteran team. I think what you're seeing is there's a difference now between kind of the teams that are churning out NBA talent, like Duke and Kentucky, and then there's teams that are churning out NCAA tournament wins. And those teams that are churning out NCAA tournament wins are experienced. And I think you're gonna see a shift towards that where teams are gonna have to figure out now, do they wanna be an NBA factory or a team that wins a lot in March? And I think it's all because of the transfer portal, but also getting back to the Big 12. I think probably the Big East might've been the best conference in college basketball, which is top to bottom. You look at it, a lot of really good teams. Yeah, yeah, it's college basketball is a blast. This tournament's been incredible, and the Final Four will be too. Now, a quick look at your poll question results. The poll questions are brought to you by Midland Exteriors. Love the home you live in. Call today for a free estimate. All right, last week's question was, how far will K-State go in the NCAA tournament? I know the answer. Uh, <laughs> losing in the Sweet 16 got 21% of the vote. Losing in the Elite Eight, we got 21% of the vote. Mm -hmm. Losing in the final four, got 43% of the vote. And then a national championship was 15% of the vote. Boy, I tell you what, there are 58% of our viewers really disappointed. Here's this week's question, that was math. 
what was the best basketball conference this season? We want to hear from you. We've given you the three choices. A, the Big Ten. B, the Big 12. C, the Big East. Sorry, ACC. Big, big anything else. Pac-12. What am I leaving out? SEC. SEC. We don't like you. You weren't in the discussion. Vote on our Twitter page at The Drive 13. All right, that will do it for this half of the two-minute drill, but we'll be right back with more on KU and K-State on The Drive. Welcome back to The Drive, fueled by BriggsAuto.com. We have returned as we continue our weekly two-minute drill. This segment of the two-minute drill is sponsored by Copeland Insurance Agency, part of your community for more than 60 years. All right, Fitz. Well, you covered the game earlier, but what has this season meant for the future of Kansas State basketball? It, it was remarkable when you consider how much Kansas State had lost over the last three years that now by accessing the transfer portal and doing so with great care and precision, and I mean that sincerely, Jerome Tang built a national title contender within one year. And granted, he did it by bringing in some great experienced players to go with his two, yes, two returnees, Marquise Noel, of course, and Ish Masood. <clears throat> it's remarkable, though, when you stop and think about this. Outside of the two freshmen that didn't play much at, or at all this season, this team was entirely comprised of players who did not start their careers at Kansas State University. That's right. Every one of the main guys on this team was a transfer either from the Division I ranks or the JUCO ranks. It's an amazing thing you can do now. Next year, K-State won't be as veteran. I mentioned the age of San Diego State in the last segment. Well, the second oldest team in this tournament was Kansas State at 22.8 years old. This was a veteran team. They had played a lot of basketball. And while some of these guys had never played in the NCAA tournament, they did have some experience, and they certainly looked at it at times, looked like it at times. Next year, they'll be younger. They will turn to the transfer portal and three red shirts that sat out this season and try to recraft a roster. But it seems pretty clear to me at this point, Michael, <clears throat> if you're a transfer and you have Jerome Tang and his Kansas State coaches interested in you, you stop and look because he knows how to use you. He knows how to maximize you. And he didn't just build a great roster. He built an incredible locker room, maybe the most cohesive locker room I have covered at Kansas State in my entire career. And he did it with a bunch of guys who at this time last year were almost entirely strangers. That's remarkable, Michael. It's absolutely incredible what Jerome Tang did with this team in such short notice. But here they are, finished third in the Big 12, went to the Elite Eight, and were picked for last and expected to do almost nothing this year. The portal has changed the game decisively. It's incredible. It really is, and I'm fascinated to see what this team looks like this time next year because I think we mentioned early in the season, right, this looks like a little bit of a Baylor team at the length. How much are they able to build on that again this offseason? I'm really fascinated to see yep. what Jerome Tang does. Yeah, he, he knew what kind of players he wanted. He knew what kind of people he wanted, and he accomplished that, and it's pretty remarkable. Well, with scholarships opening up for Bill Self and the KU staff, Sir, what do you think the Jayhawks will be looking for in that transfer portal? I think just a little bit of everything. Right now, KU has two spots open, considering the four players that have left, and I think they're going to end up having about four spots total. And I think you're going to see KU go for just about everything. I think looking at the big man position is probably where I'll start because that's where the sliding doors kind of comes from, where KJ Adams played center, but I believe that they'll probably try and move him to be on the wing again, like was the plan going into this year before the big man KU had really did not live up to expectations. So I think KU first and foremost is going to go after a big, big man in the portal some of that fits what Bill Self looks for. That way, Ernest Duda can come off the bench, Zuby Ejiofor can provide spot minutes, and then you've also got your small ball option in KJ Adams. I like the look of that center position if they're able to get a big man in the portal. Now, I think you look at the perimeter, you lose Grady Dick, you lose Kevin McCuller, you lose Jalen Wilson. Hmm. You gotta find replacements there. And so I think you're gonna see them go after kind of bigger wings in the portal, someone maybe that can handle the ball a little bit to help with DeJuan Harris. I do think Kansas is gonna go back to what you saw maybe four years ago with the two point guard system with Frank Mason, Devontae Graham, or maybe Dewan Harris will be paired up with the freshman Marco Jackson, or maybe someone out of the transfer portal. So I think those wing positions are gonna be really fascinating. Okay, you need some shooting, they need more scoring punch. And then I think what's gonna end up happening here too is 
if they get a fourth portal person, that person will probably off the bench because Dewan Harris is going to start and KJ Adams is going to start as well. So that person might have to come off the bench, but if they're a scoring guard who can provide some punch a la Malik Newman in 2018, I think you feel pretty good about this roster going into next year. You bring in a four new freshmen. El Marco Jackson is at the McDonald's All-American game right now. He's standing out. And so it's really going to dictate what they do in the portal. So I think those are some things that I'll be keeping an eye on. I'm fascinated to see the profile of player that Kansas goes after. Are they going to go after the high-scoring mid major player like a Joseph Yesifu a few years ago, or they go after more maybe proven power five high major transfers like Kevin McCullough. I'm super fascinated to see what this roster yeah. looks like as well. Yeah, it's uh, the portal's incredible, and it's such a gift for these players. The guy starring for San Diego State, and excuse me, his name totally escapes me as I sit here on the set, started at junior college, plays two years at Seattle with a capacity in their gym of less than a thousand, and now he's the, one of the star players going to the Final Four. That's not probably going to happen without the portal. It's been amazing for the game. And now we step out of bounds, and Out of Bounds is brought to you by Dara's Corner Market. We love local, and we are local for you. Michael, the World Baseball Classic got a lot of publicity recently and really good TV ratings. What can the MLB do to get that type of consistent attention? And I would start with letting me watch the Kansas City Royals without mm. having to subscribe to cable. I would like to watch it. Yeah, I think first of all, accessibility is big, right? For fans, local fans to be able to watch. But I'll tell you what, I, what really strikes me is the atmospheres. And you look at a lot of these games being played in Miami, right? They're allowing instruments, other things to make it more of an atmosphere. How many times you go to a baseball game and it's very just dry, quiet, not a lot going on outside of maybe the organist playing some music. Mm -hmm. I think you look at these games and if they're fun and seem like a fun atmosphere, it keeps you in tune because that shows off and it rubs off to the players as well where maybe they're feeling more in tune as well. So I think first of all, changing the atmosphere maybe around those games would help a lot. Here's my thought and it, there's been, I think it's The Athletic has written this recently. <clears throat> when you're on Twitter, you get these promoted tweets from news companies it's the same story over and over but this one i love the mlb is going to expand two more franchises which seems you know cut in stone right now is one uh, might be out west the other might be nashville we don't know but their proposal is to scrap the al and nl and i'm all in on it mm. and reorganize this by region so that the kansas city royals play the st louis cardinals in division and maybe the Chicago Cubs. The New York teams play each other. The Chicago teams play each other. Look at baseball right now. The only rivalry the networks seem to care about are Boston and New York. Well, that's because it's regional and intense. We need more regional rivalries so that you can cheer for the hometown team against the town you hate, which in this case, if you're Kansas City, is St. Louis. But also playing in Denver on a regular basis would also be good for the game. That it would, that it would. Now let's hear from the fans. Our fan question is sponsored by Metal Arc Retirement Awaits in Manhattan, where you can live your way every day. All right, Fitz, our fan question this week is, how great has this athletic year been for the state of Kansas? Tom and Topeka, Fitz, I'll let you take it. Well, uh, let's, let's think about this. A year ago, um, 51 weeks ago, actually, yeah, Kansas won the national title. And then K-State wins the Big 12 football title. Oh, yeah, the Kansas City Chiefs win the Super Bowl. K-State goes to the Elite Eight. A little disappointment there for Kansas in the end of the basketball season, but they won the Big 12 title. That's been incredible. Now we just need the Royals to get their you-know-what together. Yeah, plus Kansas football, first bowl oh, eligibility, yeah. right? And I think overall it's great, right? A lot of eyes on the state of Kansas. And I'd like to give a shout-out to the Kansas women that did what the other sports couldn't and beat Arkansas. What is going <laughs> on with these matchups? It's kind of strange. It is strange. And hey, they're playing in the final four of the WNIT. Pretty Good neat. Good for them. So make sure to remember, remember to ask us your questions on our Facebook page and on Twitter at The Drive 13. When we return, we will look at our predictions here on The Drive. Welcome back to The Drive, fueled by BriggsAuto.com. It's time to head down the home stretch of this week's show, and now let's take a look at our predictions. Oh, boy. Predictions are brought to you by Kites and Kites Aggieville Draft House. Meeting your friends at Kites and the Draft House since 1954. Remember next year to make your weekly predictions on our Twitter page. Actually, you can do it this time at the Drive 13. We've got one more set of predictions. Let's look at last week's results. <clears throat> um, Michael, we, we lost to the fans. 
That, I mean, we can't, even if we count this week, if they go 0-3, we're still losers. We're just nice hosts. Yeah, we let them win. That's what it was. Good job, folks that watch us. I don't know why you watch us here. This week's picks. Uh, we'll start with San Diego State against Florida Atlantic. In the final four, we set this up, I think, as a pick em. We sure did. Who do you got? We didn't even discuss this. Who do you got? I genuinely think San Diego State will win. They're so gritty defensively. I, I got to go with FAU. That's Jerome Tang's team now. Mm. All right. Well, next is UConn in Miami. Mm. I think we've also got this one as a pick -em. Even though UConn might be a, a yeah. bit of a favorite, I'll, I'll be picking UConn. I'll stick with UConn, too. I think they're really good, although Nigel Pack of Miami is pretty darn good. And for our last game, it's not even a game. We want you to pick the winner of the Final Four. You know who you picked in the semifinals, which one of those teams wins. Pick the champion. We did a little bit different. Again, make your picks on our Twitter page, at the Drive 13 And now it's time for our final on-the-clock segment of the year. On the Clock, sponsored by Carpet One. Buy local for a strong local community. Take it away, Michael Swain. Well, I'll start off by just saying a huge thank you to everyone at WIBW for the opportunity to jump in and also to, to Scott Chasen for moving on to create some space here to work with Tim Fitzgerald. I'm very grateful. It has been uh, an incredible blessing to be able to work on this show and to work with Fitz and everyone behind the scenes here. So a huge thank you to everyone. Very excited for next year. I promise the predictions will be a lot better. I, I don't make that promise. I, I, I performed as best as I could. Look, the aging of college basketball is kind of fun, but it's also kind of annoying. And I'm speaking as a guy who covered one of the oldest teams in the country at Kansas State. It'll come back to normal once these COVID years run out and, and players no longer have that bonus year for what happened a few years ago. But it has been very entertaining, and because of the way Jerome Tang set up his team, he set up his program. Now K-State has some really good momentum going into next season. He'll have to go to the portal a little bit more. But also, I don't see Kansas State being a program that will have a great deal of turnover on the roster. It wasn't that way at Baylor. And the atmosphere Jerome Tang creates in that locker room is the type of atmosphere that makes a player want to stick it through and see what happens. Michael, it's been a fun year. I, we moved to the big set here at the end for reasons we won't explain. But we appreciate you watching this final edition of the season. And thanks for watching all year long. Keep up with us, with us on social media.